Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's theCUBE, covering EMC World 2015. Brought to you by EMC, Brocade, and VCE. EMC World 2015, day two of three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Uh, we've been coming to EMC World for I think six years. I think it's where we started the Cube in 2010. So we're always happy to come here, and we're changing it up a little bit this year. We like to talk about innovation. We want to be a little innovative, so we're actually going to have a little customer panel. So on my left, immediately, as uh, you all recognize, is the dean himself, dean of Big Data, Bill Schmarzo, CTO of Global Services for the Big Data Practice. To his left, I'll make sure I get this right, is Elizabeth Fletcher. Welcome, CPA and CA, Deputy Director, Smart Metering and Infrastructure Program at, at uh, BC Hydro. Welcome. Thank you. It's a big, important job. I like it. And then next to her, we have Chris Pershing, Founder and CTO of Eagle View Technologies. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So, first off, why don't we give a little background about what you do uh, in your role and, and the company. Certainly, I work for BC Hydro, which is a crown corporation located in British Columbia. We generate, purchase, distribute, and uh, sell electricity to uh, people in British Columbia. My role in uh, the smart metering program is I lead the program currently to uh, develop and implement smart metering technology as well as uh, the other infrastructure, including the uh, application for detecting of theft of energy, which is what my focus has been. Excellent. And Chris? I'm Chris Pershing, uh, Eagle View Technologies. We've got two main lines of business. The first is the, the capture of very high resolution, uh, very widespread uh, uh, capture of aerial imagery, both uh, downward looking and, and oblique, kind of angular looking. And our second line of business is basically uh, extracting content out of those images. Uh, originally, Eagle View's main line of business was taking these images and creating three-dimensional, uh, very accurate, Authoritative models that we could uh, that could be used for estimating a bunch of parameters, and we since then expanded out, extracting different kinds of content out of those images. All right, great. Well, welcome. So, the dean is here at Big Data, so it's a big de a big data panel. So let's jump in a little bit and talk about what does big data mean to you? Are you guys using big data? How have you started your journey? Obviously, you're you're moving down that path. So Elizabeth, let's start with you. How have things changed with the with the growth of big data, the explosion, this opportunity okay. all around data? Well, we started our path down the big data trail uh, back in 2012. We had almost completed our installation of 1.9 million smart meters, and we were starting to receive all of that data every day, hourly information about uh, the uh, the energy being consumed on the grid. We needed to do something with that, and uh, in particular, our first use case. Uh, was for um, an application that would help us to identify where electricity was being stolen off of the grid. It's a very significant problem for us, we identified back in 2010. We've, we were seeing at that time $100 million of energy theft every year. $100 million of energy theft? Energy theft. I was going to ask you, my next question was going to be, is that a big deal? But uh, I think you already <laughs> answered yes. my question. Million, yes, yeah. so uh, as part of the smart metering business case, we identified uh, the theft detection benefit was estimated at $700 million. Canadian. You estimated 700. 700 million. That's based on a present value over 20 years. Okay, okay. And was that really one of the main drivers of doing the smart meters, or was that just one of many benefits? It, it was one of many, but it is the most significant benefit by far. Hmm. Wow. And how do people still, how were they grabbing power? Are they just tapping off and running it somewhere? It's a variety, but it, I mean, it, it goes from uh, tampering at the meter, tampering upstream, connecting into the grid upstream of the meter, connecting in at the trans, uh, trans, um, transformer, or even in the primary, so at high voltage. So lots of different ways that uh, theft can be stolen. Hmm? $100 million. <laughs> yes. That's a lot of Teslas. It's a lot of Teslas. So. That is a lot of Teslas. <laughs> yeah. And Chris, so you talked about kind of the evolution of your business, this really high res imagery and, and what you've been able to do with it, and it sounds like even modify your, your business. Uh, talk a little bit about the role that Big Data played and how you got there from here, or got here from there, I should say. So, so again, for us, for our company, Big Data really means the, the fact that we're capturing and recapturing every couple of years, uh, you know, upwards of 90% of the, of the population in the United States. So we have, we have a time history going back, you know, every couple of years over a lot of this area. And we also have the ability to then uh, take these images at ever-increasing resolutions. And the higher the resolution, the more 
uh, applications you can unlock, more things you can see out of these images. And so the, the, the analytics we can run on these images, the types of models that we can build from them, the, the, the content that we can see and extract and observe from that is, is really kind of the foundation of what big data means for us. And then to be able to catalog that in a, in a property-centric kind of way so that we build up content and information about particular parcels, we can see how they change over time, we can see what's happening on them. Um, and as that, as that parcel-centric database grows, there's additional layers of analytics you can run on that, uh, both uh, serving the markets that we serve today and, and you know, ones that are yet to be uh, realized. And who are some of your customers that are using this data? So, i uh, got a couple of bands of customers. One is insurance companies, uh, which, uh, you know, if there's a, a storm that takes out or damages, you know, could be thousands or tens or even hundreds of thousands of roofs. Okay. We have the imagery of what used to be there, what it looked like before, so we can measure it without sending somebody up on a broken or damaged roof. Uh, so that's, uh, so we help them settle claims faster. Uh, we help them do it in a safer way. And we, we help mediate that conversation between the insurance company and the contractor that's got to replace the roof. Okay. Uh, the, other, the other group is the contractors themselves, not just for storm damage, but for, you know, roofs wear out. They need to get replaced. They get damaged for other reasons. People, uh, you know, people have extensions put on, et cetera. So okay. contractors uh, that deal with anything that has to do with the roof and, you know, in more recent years with walls and siding as well. So talk a little bit about, as you, you're, you're going down this path, right, you know you're going to get more data, you're getting more pictures, higher resolution imagery, but at the same, so you've got increasing storage requirements and complexity. At the same time, you know that it's going to open up some new business opportunity. Mm -hmm. Talk about how you guys are going through kind of the business trade-off decisions in making the commitment to go forward. It was it kind of, we know we're going to have something, you know, we're going to have a market for this, let's just go get it because we can or was it really uh, opportunity driven that said, if we have this higher level of resolution, then we can sell that particular service or a new service? It's a, it's a little bit of both. There's the natural progression of the, you know, the, the silicon, the sensors getting higher densities, the, you know, the, 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 the various optics you can put on the, on the plane and whatnot. So there's, there's a natural progression that can bring down the resolution incrementally, which is kind of the, the natural flow of it. But then there are those those leaps where you say, well, gee, if you could, if you could, if you could get twice the resolution, what else does this unlock? You know, what what, what can we see at this next resolution level that we can't see today? And and you know, where are the markets that are going to want to to know about that data? So, both you, Elizabeth and Chris, are much further along down the path of big data than many many of the customers. If you look at where you are, how you've gotten there, are there any sort of learnings that you could share with other people, the sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly about things that, you, that you've learned that you like to you know, share more broadly? I think for me, the, uh, the understanding that while there may be technical challenges, the biggest problems may tend to be in the area of governance and making sure that the appropriate business groups are involved and are in fact driving to the solution, not being let, they need to drive business. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So the, you found that if, if the business leaders were leading the initiative, you had a lot more success and, and staying power for the initiative underway. Yes, yes. Are those business users also helping you to uncover sort of your next use cases coming on the path? Absolutely. And we're finding that there are um, business users coming to, uh, to the project team to uh, cry out for access to the data. <laughs> they want the access now, please. And what can we do to make sure that they get it as quickly as possible? <laughs> That's a great sign for the organization yeah. that you get that kind of that kind of hunger and adoption of data. Yeah. Chris, what about your business? What are sort of the what have you learned along the path? I guess I learned that to the extent that you can um, recognize ahead of time the value of the data that you're generating and, and kind of look ahead to see where you might be able to use it and repurpose it and, and get additional value from it. Um, you know, the really you recognize that potential, the, the, the more lead time you have to try to organize it and try to, you know, try to structure things in such a way that you can, that you're in a good position to take advantage of those analytics later on. And that's, you know, we're, we're in a very high growth uh, mode, you know, from our, from our get go. And so it was a lot of scramble, scramble, scramble. And, you know, to, to that extent, um, you know, I guess you kind of rewind a little bit. If, if you had a little bit, if you're able to step back and, and and think about how you would catalog and organize this and how, you, how you'd structure the approach, you know, it just saves a little bit of headache down the road. 
you seem to be in a point that a lot of organizations want to get to, which is the opportunity to create new monetization opportunities. How, how are you working with the business in order to sort of identify and realize those opportunities? Well, we've got really good relationships with uh, many of the insurance companies and with many of our uh, large uh, contractors that we work with. And so, with that relationship, we can, we can ask them, you know, what, you know, we can we can work with them. Say, what what are you, what are other processes you go through, especially manual processes? What are, what are the other reasons why you come out to the site in the first place? And are there are are there additional questions that we can answer for you before you get out there? It's very interesting because it's always you know it, it's it's not always obvious what the value of that data is going to be, right? And how you can potentially monetize it. But there's always this kind of innate feeling that more is better. And now with a lot of the technologies you can store more, you don't, it's not, ah, what are we going to store, what are we going to get rid of? So it's interesting as that develops. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about kind of surprises. As, as you started down this journey and the data started coming in and you started to actually put some analysis on it, were there any surprises that you just had no idea that were coming? I think we realized uh, fairly quickly that it, it was going to be more complicated than we thought. Which and way? in that uh, the, the complexity of what we were trying to do um, was more than we could could consume in, in a, a very short period of time. So we ended up um, making it into multi-phases so that we could start with the first phase being relatively simple analytics, get our feet wet, come to understand it, develop the processes, and start to build that, that data scientist knowledge so that we could then move on to the next phase where we added more complexity. And we're now at the process of implementing our third phase in this fall, which adds a, it gets us to where we wanted to be all along. Mm -hmm. And is, it, is, it, is the complexity a function of more data, more variety of data, different ways to analyze the data? How, how do you how do you see complexity and value unfolding over time in these kind of phases? For us, it was the uh, some of the advanced algorithms that we were trying to apply, some of which we had patent, patented, um, as well as incorporating additional uh, data sets to, in particular, allow us to estimate where we have missing data. Because you don't always have all the data, sometimes you have to estimate it, and that's um, important to be able to do that with, with accuracy as well. Right. What about you, Chris? Any uh, kind of fun, fun surprises? Well, I think one of them is that, you know, again, as we as we grew up, so to speak, uh, you know, as our volumes increased and we did more and more business, you know, I, I, we were on a big data path before I think we recognized we were on a big data path, right? And so it was a pleasant surprise to know that, you know, we were more right than wrong and kind of the things that we were doing kind of to set ourselves up for 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 the next step. Um, so in that respect, you know, it's, uh, you know, lucky uh, lucky happenstance there. Uh, but the other one, uh, with respect to our customers too, is one, one of our ongoing challenges and, and surprises is really trying to figure out what they what they want to do with the data because it's, you know, it's it, it, in a lot of ways it, it's a new way of looking at things, and so it's it's sometimes they don't know what they what they want or the, or they don't know what's possible, and so it's it's kind of this push and pull of trying to help them figure out what is possible. Now, another kind of part of the big data story that, that that's evolving is, you know, you always had your own internal data, but now there's all these external sources of data. And before, you know, a lot of enterprises did incorporate some of this external data into their own processes to get additional value. Are you guys using any external data sets that maybe you didn't use before that now you can more easily integrate into your process? We incorporated a visualization layer using Google Earth because we needed to be able to see where our assets were in a geographic space. Um, and we've also incorporated weather data uh, as a means, again, of helping us to estimate when we don't have the actual data. And has that been provided just a whole other level of insight? It, it, it has. I mean, the, the, the visualization was key to our solution because it's much of the insight is is gathered from the location and the specifics of uh, where a particular anomaly is being identified. I got a friend who's got some really high resolution photos. You want to uh, move off the Google? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how about you, Chris? Are, are, you, are you using other stuff beyond your primary data to really augment, or are you? Well, well, there are there are some things? data sets that help us um, that help us do what we do. You know, collateral information that that the insurance companies, for instance, want. But what we're finding more f frequently is we're having conversations with folks that, that have data sets that they've developed in their line of business that can answer part of the question that they're after. And with our 
imagery and things that we can get on the imagery, we can answer part of the question. Now the conversation is, can we conflate those data sets to gain confidence and, and have a more confident answer on what they're after? And so that's that's a really interesting opportunity before us, and that's that's um, you know that's one of the areas that uh, you know it's one it's one of the paths that we're heading down. Right, right. What I find interesting about this is in, in both cases, one is that that. You, in order to be successful, you got to make sure you're, you're biting off on opportunities on the analytics side, small enough so you're not trying to swallow the whole ocean. That you got to sort of realize it's an iterative process, start small, build on success. And Chris, in your case, sometimes your users, customers don't know what they don't know. They right. don't know what they need. Right. And so there's a very much a high exploration kind of a process that needs to take place, almost an envisioning of the realm of what's possible sort of process. Right. Very great stories. So we're, we're getting the hook. They're going to start the concert here behind us. They've got the electric cello and some other fun instruments. So I want to give you the last word. A lot of practitioners like to watch a cube. They love to hear from their peers, right? They're sitting there. They're either getting started. They're contemplating getting started. They're trying to figure out how to, they're going to get some investment and, and sell some people inside it. What would you call them? The hippos. Yeah, that the aren't hippos. necessarily buying into this whole big data thing. We've always done it this way. So advice for your fellow practitioners if you're looking at them saying, here's what I would tell you based on my experience to help you be successful on your big data journey. Let's start with you, Chris. I guess really, really think about the potential of what your data might be used for you know, years down the road and, and, and plan an architect for that goal, right? Because um, you know, I think, of, I think of, by and large, a lot, of, a lot of data that's being accumulated is being squirreled away and people don't really understand what they could do with it or, or if there's any value left in it. Right. Elizabeth? I think it would be let the business drive it. They need to be the one making the choices, making those decisions, uh, picking the priorities of what you need to focus on so that they can make the decisions that they're in the best interest of the business as a whole. Mm -hmm. yeah, Bill, you're out there on the, uh, the firing lines every day. I mean, what they're saying is, is the truth. It's, it's <laughs> encouraging, it's, and you can see why they're being successful because I think they're, you know, they're focused on letting the business drivers, the business users drive it. They're trying to iterate quickly in small uh, iterations to drive success. You're trying to figure out what you could do with the data, visioning what's out there. It's, both of them are great stories. Congratulations. Great. Hey, thank, you. thank you. Thanks for coming on, Chris. Elizabeth, sharing your story. Good thank luck. You. I hope you, uh, it's $100 million in stolen electricity. That's a lot of electricity. Uh, Dean, as always, good to see you. Thanks for stopping by. I'm Jeff Frick. We're at EMC World 2015, coming to the end of day two, three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. We'll be back all day tomorrow, Wednesday. So tune in for more great interviews. You're watching theCUBE. See you tomorrow.